The following sermon was presented on Sunday, April 8th, 2018 by Pastor Daniel Calcagno at Glad Tidings Church of God in Font Hill, Ontario. It is titled, Continuing Our Legacy. For more videos, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and visit our website at gladtidingschurchofgod.com. So sometimes my week is such where I will have the sermon written and prepared on Tuesday, Wednesday, and sometimes it's such where I'm still working on it into, into Sunday morning, actually. Uh, I finished my sermon today at 7.30 this morning, but you know what? It was worth it. I'm glad, I wait. I'm glad my week was very busy and I had to wait to, uh, to write my sermon today because I think that today is a very special message that I'm going to share with you today. Uh, it's, it's interesting. We've been here now for four years. It was early April in 2014 when we first introduced ourselves to you and, and we began that process. And it's taken these four years to, to, um, for me to be built up into somebody that can lead, and I'm still very much learning. But it was one year ago, it was one year ago when we installed our officers for 2017 that I preached a sermon called Run to Win. Who here remembers run to win. I know Elaine will remember that because she shared the pulpit with me and, and presented our ideas about the leadership team and, and, and everything we were, were working on at that point. But it was in that message that I shared with you that uh, God has been active over the past, at that point, three years and now four years. He's been active in a construction project. He's been building me up into a pastor I wasn't a pastor before this church, so he's been building me up into a pastor, and he's been rebuilding our church, making it into a growing and active and effective church. So in that message last year at Run to Win, I kind of mixed some metaphors, because on the one hand, I'm talking about the fact that we must run to win. We're running a race as a church, and then we're rebuild, God is rebuilding our church like it's a construction project, so kind of a mixed metaphor. But the work that God is doing in our lives as individuals, of course, but also more, not more importantly, but as well as a church, the work he's doing in us is like a race, a race that we need to win, that we need to, we need to run this race in such a way that we're going to win this race. Do you remember what I meant by that? That we're going to do God's work in this church and in this community in such a way where we will get to the end of our lives, as I said in, in the installation service, that, that Jesus will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. That we will have done what God wanted us to do this side of the kingdom of God. This side of the kingdom of God, we will have done what God wanted us to do. So that's success. That, we're going to clarify the win of our church. Do everything that God wants us to do this side of the kingdom. However, this race that we are running is not a sprint. It is a marathon. Has anybody here run a marathon? No, I've, I certainly never have. I actually know a couple people who, uh, one person who likes to run marathons and another person who used to run marathons. And I know, uh, as little as I know about running marathons, I know that you do need to train hard if you're going to survive a marathon. Some marathons can last hours depending on the length, right? So you have to run in that race, in that marathon, in such a way where you don't overdo it, you don't run so fast that you become uh, fatigued too early and you're not able to finish the race, but you also don't run it too slowly so that you lose. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll lose, right? You have to find somewhere in the middle where you are running it at a pace where you can win that race. So if we're running to win, but we're running a marathon, then we have to figure out how to run that race. What do we need to run the race that we're on as a, as a church in terms of our ministry and our goals. Well, what we are doing is we're working with God to rebuild our church. We're, we want to see our church transformed into a, 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 like a, an amazing, an astonishing, an astonishingly, uh, we want to be astonished by God in what he's doing among us. Amen? We want our church to be growing and active in that way. We want to be a, be amazed by that. So in order to do that, we have to run with endurance. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, 1. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
We must run with endurance. We must, so this work that we're doing to transform our church, to put it just more simply, is a long-term project. It's a long-term thing. It's not a short-term thing. So we think about it this way. If we're running this race with endurance and it's a long-term thing, we shouldn't expect or do things in such a way where there's drastic sweeping changes all at once or very quickly. Instead, what we should be doing and what we are doing is step by step, we're looking and analyzing and, and, and identifying aspects of our church, what we do as a church. We're assessing its effectiveness and we're going to ask God to lead us and guide us to do something that's even more effective with, with our ultimate goals in terms of going deeper and reaching out to people and so on. Now, so if we do this with patience and endurance, we will see our church transformed. And we will be able to look back years from now and we will be able to say God did rebuild our church through what we were doing, what we did what he did in us and through us. But just to clarify, why am I saying rebuilding our church? Why not say build up our church? Well, because our church has been around for a while, right? Our church has been around for over 100 and since 1846. And this building, we've been at this building for 50 years this year. So I say rebuilding because there were times in the past when our church was growing and active, Way more so than it is right now. We can, we can think to at least two different times in the past 50 years alone where we were growing and active, but then for various reasons, there was splits and declines and, and things went the other way, right? And we want to see God rebuild us to get to back to that point and then go even further than we've ever gone as a church before. And so I recognize and I understand that we have a legacy at our church. I want to honor the legacy of our church. And I mention legacy and I feel a weight of responsibility. When I think about the legacy of our church, how that we have a history and we have so many great people who have come before us, I feel the weight of responsibility that I don't want to squander the fact that we now have the responsibility of, of being glad tidings, being our church. So the Font Hill Church of God goes back to the 1800s and we have a responsibility to see that it continues on into the future. And I'm becoming more aware of this because I've been taking a class, I'm becoming aware of the history of our church, of our church and of the Church of God as a whole. I've been taking a class called Church of God History. Um, so I've been made aware of the great men and women who have come before us. And it's, it's, there's so many of them and there's, their stories are deep. So I, I'm learning very slowly about them. But these are people who had questions about the Bible and they sought out the answers, right? They, they, they had questions just like many people have questions. But not everyone has the courage to go and seek the answers. And then when, they're fa when they find those answers, they, they embrace them, even if those answers are different than the mainstream, Right? So the people who came before us in the 1800s to start the Church of God, they were courageous. I look up to them because they started with nothing. You know, we're so grateful that we have the establishment of our church and of our conference behind us, and we can build upon it. But they had to establish it in the first place. And the people who established our church way back in 1846, I, I, I don't know too much about it. I'd like to learn more about who it was that specifically established our church back in, in that day and, and what it all entailed, what, what challenges they faced. I'm sure they faced many challenges. But there were also people all throughout the United States, especially in certain states, and Church of God congregations were established there as well. And over time, these congregations began to get to know one another. The pastors of these congregations would often travel to each other's churches and preach in each other's churches, as far as I understand. And over time there came a, a need for and a desire for all of us to come together and establish some kind of national conference, a general conference. And so if we came together as a general conference, we could work together. You know, it's much better to, to have more people on board because you can get more done. You can do more w wonderful things. So we had the desire in those days to have some sort of central location, headquarters, where we could publish materials and we could establish a Bible school. 
So those were some of the original ideas, reasons why it was important to come together and have a headquarters and have a general conference. And so finally, after several attempts, in 1921, the, general, the Church of God General Conference was established. It became official that we were a conference together. We weren't just separate congregations. We were now linked together. And one of the persons who was instrumental in the formation of the General Conference in the early 20s was a man by the name of F.L. Austin. He was the first executive secretary, as they called him back then. Now they're called executive director. That's Seth Ross's position. F.L. Austin was the first executive secretary of the General Conference. And he, was the, he became, in the 20s, the editor of the Restitution Herald. Who here is aware that our conference has a quarterly, what would you call it, publication that is put out every quarter? It's called the Restitution Herald. Is everybody aware of that? I'm, you know, it's so funny because it's been four years and, and I don't really, I haven't really opened my mind to realize, no, that's a, that's a quarterly publication that we put out every, every year, four times a year, and, and I actually have two assignments that I need to be getting done very soon so that I can actually submit articles to that, to that publication. So I don't know if they'll get published or not, but that, that should be interesting. But that's one of the purposes of our headquarters is to have is to be in publishing and, and to have a Bible school. And, and, and there's, we can go into the history of, of the Bible school. Uh, I believe it, it started at this time as the Bible training class. And then in 1939, it became Oregon Bible College in Oregon, Illinois. And then eventually became Atlanta Bible College when we moved to Georgia. But the name F.L. Austin might be familiar to some of you because he was our pastor. In 1908, from 1908 to 1922, was was anybody alive in that in that? <laughs> um, at, at that time, uh, we not only had a congregation here in Fawn Hill, we had a congregation in Niagara Falls, New York. Am I correct about that? So we had a congregation here and in Niagara Falls, New York. And he, as far as I understand, would go back and forth to minister among uh, you know in in both congregations. As far as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong. Now, none of us were really alive back then to experience and to know F.L. Austin and to be under his leadership here at, at Font Hill Church of God. But none of, so none of us were there, but I can imagine, and I, can, and I, I guarantee you, that they, who, like, because during that time, uh, they planted, uh, rather, he and his wife, Austin and his wife, uh, constructed a home for themselves right here in Font Hill. So they, they built a home in Font Hill, and he was the pastor at, during the time when the construction of the old church building, the building that we were in previous to this building, that was constructed in 1908, I believe, and, they, and he was the pastor at that time. So what that means is it, there was growth at that time. There was enough uh, there was reason to build a new church building. Just like in the 60s, there was a reason to build this building. Right? And so I think about the people who were alive back then and, the, and those of you who were here even in the 60s when this building was built, that, that you, you had to face your own challenges. They had to face their challenges. But they knew the importance of the work that, that is to be done in this area for, for God and for the presentation of the gospel. And they knew it was a long-term project. That's why they built those, those church buildings. They knew that this church is going to be, be here beyond us. We better build, a, build with that in mind. You know, we have a nice big sanctuary. So some might say, well, why, why do we have a, such a, in fact, one other pastor told me a, a few years, a couple years ago, you know, why do you guys have such a big building? You're a small church. You know, uh, you should sell it and then go find a smaller location. You'll save a lot of money. Well, we hope to fill these pews one day. Amen? We hope to see this church filled with people who are hungry for the Lord and hungry for doing the work of ministry. So we, we, we look ahead to that, and I guarantee you that's what people like F.L. Austin and, and the four uh, thought that they had of establishing a church building and, and, and the church back in those days. But as I mentioned, or alluded to, that, that Austin was a part of the process of the formation of the General Conference. So he and his family left Font Hill in the early 1920s, and they moved to Oregon, Illinois, where where our headquarters used to be and where they formed the General Conference. As I mentioned, get this, he, he did all this. He was the se executive secretary of the General Conference. He was the founding professor of the Bible training class, which eventually became our Bible college. 
He managed a greenhouse for the conference. He managed an elderly home for the conference. And he published and edited the Restitution Herald. And he would often travel to other churches for evangelistic services as well. And for all of this, he was paid $125 a month, which some thought was too much. <laughs> In today's dollars, that's about $2,000 a month. Isn't that a reasonable amount of money for all that work that he was doing? In fact, I think he was doing too much. He, for one, no, no one person should do that much. We, we need to talk to Seth Ross and, and tell him, you know, no one person should be doing that much. At least he doesn't have a greenhouse to run. But the sad thing is, his wife died in 1926. And I won't even get into the fact that his son was murdered in the 1930s, but that's, that's later. But he actually had to take, after his wife died, and a couple years after that, he actually had to take time off because he, ha he was suffering from extreme exhaustion. It's understandable. He was doing so much for, for, the, for the conference. You see, if we are running the race and we run it in the wrong way, we'll wipe ourselves out. We'll, we'll become useless. We'll be burned out and we won't be able to do the work. So I'm learning, and I think we all need to learn, how to not to spread ourselves too thinly and to make sure that the work is spread amongst us so that we can get all the work done, but no one person is doing it all themselves. So I look to the life of F.L. Austin and to the many others who came before us, and I'm inspired to continue the legacy. Amen? Are you inspired to continue the legacy that, that we have at Glad Tidings? To run this race that we are running. To continue this legacy that has been built up for us in the, by the people in the past. They believed, again, what they were doing was important and had a purpose. And a greater purpose even beyond them. And what we are doing as a church is important. And has ramifications that we can't even dream about. We don't know what we're saying and what we're doing is affecting others. And how it might affect their eternal salvation amongst other things. Right? So what we're doing is important. We need to focus on, on the fact that the work we're doing is good and important and we need to continue that work. So as long as I'm here as your pastor and as long as I have the energy to do it and we pray that God would continue to energize me and energize all of us, I want to see our church rebuilt. I want to see our church rebuilt and I want to see us effectively proclaim the gospel and to minister to the people of Font Hill and of the Niagara region and I want to see positive results. And you know what's going to happen when we start seeing some amazing positive results? That's just going to, it's going to be like a cycle. We're going to get re-energized. Every time we see a new person come to the Lord and we see their life transformed, we're going to be energized by that. So it's going to become a cycle of energy, you know, of God-given energy, of the Holy Spirit working in people's hearts and then working in our hearts at, to continue to minister. It's going to be amazing. So, I want to share with you just for over the next few minutes here, four areas. I've, the elders and I have already shared this with the leadership team, and I want the rest of the congregation to be aware of these four areas of focus that we want to focus on, these areas that we want to focus on over the next year or so. And we feel that they're very important areas for us to, to, as I said earlier, to identify, to assess, and see how we can be more effective. There's more that we need to do as a church to see transformation, but these are important areas. So the first is in the area of greeting and integrating. What do I mean by that? Well, we want to see transformation in the area of the experience that everyone has when they come into our church. Literally, when they come into our church building on a Sunday morning, what kind of experience will they have? Will they feel welcomed? Will they feel valued and appreciated? You might have noticed that we have some greeters in the front entrance now. We have some coffee in the back. We're trying to do these information cards. We have some changes that we are working on, and I don't want you to all be taken by surprise, so I'm telling you about it now. <laughs> that there might be some things that we will be changing not, nothing too drastic, as I said. We're not going to do big sweeping changes all at once, but we want to do step by step some changes that will help us to see transformation in the way people are greeted and then integrated into our church. And look what it says do not, in Hebrews. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. We have, okay, I want us to think about it this way. The church building is our home. We are a church family, right? So what happens if... A guest comes into your home. Are you going to ignore them? Or are you going to welcome them into your home? Give them something to drink. Make them feel welcome. 
Make them feel at home. That's what we want to do with the guests who come into our church. And for all of us who are the church family, we want to feel welcomed and appreciated and valued and connected, right? So we're working on the way we greet people, everyone, especially first-time guests, but everyone. We are working on how we greet you and how you can become more integrated into our church. We want to make sure that everybody finds their place in our church. If you've been coming to our church for a while, but you're maybe not building a relationship with anyone in the church, we want to correct that. We want to see that change so that you can become better integrated and and really feel like this is your church family because we want you to be our church family. Secondly, there's the area of outreach and evangelism. We want to see our church transformed. We want to see transformation in that area of going out and preaching the gospel and, and proclaiming the gospel to people and reaching out to people. And some scriptures that came to mind for this was that Paul said that faith comes from hearing. What? Hearing the good news about Christ, the gospel message. But then he asked, or earlier he asked, how can they hear about Jesus unless someone tells them? So, for those of you who are extroverted, we're going to do, be doing some evangelistic efforts over the next few months. We want to go out into the community and, and talk to people about Jesus and talk to people about the gospel. But for the rest of us who are maybe not so extroverted, we're going to be doing some, uh, some big Sundays. We saw last Sunday. Last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday, and we had visitors. And sadly, they're not back again this week, but we did follow up with them. And, and we had the opportunity, because they were here, to get their information, and now they're on our radar, right? And so perhaps they will come back to our church as a result. So what if we did big Sundays throughout the year where all of you would feel more comfortable inviting your your friends and your family to the church and and they could come and suddenly they're they're now on our radar and we're able to reach out to them and maybe they will feel the call to, to become part of our church or to become, more importantly, a believer. So we want to do things through personal invitations, through social media, through advertising, We want to invite people on these particular Sundays. And then because we are, as I showed you in the previous slide, because we are improving our greeting and integration system, hopefully those new people who come will then now be more more prone to become part of our church. Because beyond those special Sundays, what about our weekly Sunday experience? Let me thank you for those of you who come every Sunday and come faithfully. Thank you. I appreciate it. I don't say that. I, I think I just realized I don't, I don't thank you enough for coming on Sundays. I put a lot of work into every Sunday. The worship team and all the people who are involved put a lot of work into what we do on a Sunday morning. But without you guys coming, there's really no point. There is no point to do that. So thank you for coming and making my, the work that we do worth it so that we can learn together and grow together. I appreciate that. But what about our weekly Sunday experience? Can it be better? We, want, we do want to see transformation in our Sunday service so that people who come to our Sunday service, all of you and all of our guests, will be motivated to go deeper in Christ. Now, is our service already effective in that way? In some ways. Can we be better? Of course. So what I want to learn over the next few months, and what we want to do as a church, is how can I preach and how can we structure our service in such a way so that you will respond, all of you and our guests will respond positively to what we're doing, to what I'm saying and to what we're doing as a, uh, during their service. In the book of Acts, Peter is giving this powerful sermon during the holiday of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And look at the response of the people. It says, they were pierced to the heart And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? That's the kind of response I want from all of you every Sunday. Okay, Daniel, what shall we do? Right? That's the kind of response I want from everyone who experiences our Sunday services. Okay, I get what you're saying. How important it is what what we believe in and what we are a part of. Okay, what do we do? What's our response? How can we be a part of it? If our services are not getting that response out of all of you and out of first-time guests, then we're not being as effective as we could be. So we want to change that. We want to see transformation in that area. You'll see that hopefully over the next few months. So we want to see other people make a positive... We want to see new people especially 
make a positive decision for Christ. And lastly, small groups. We want to see transformation in how our church connects through small groups. You know, we've known the need for small groups in our church for a while, but I feel like now finally we have some some systems, some information, some guidance and how we could possibly implement small groups in our church. Because I heard it said this way, and I think it's so interesting, that we don't want to be a church that simply has small groups, that we are a church with small groups. We want to be a church of small groups, that everyone needs to be a part of some kind of small group so that you have the opportunity to go deeper in your relationship with God and with one another. Now, what we do on Sunday morning is great, and it is an opportunity to go deeper, but You can't really talk to each other on a Sunday morning. I'm grateful for the time we have before and after. But it's only really in a small group where you have the ability to talk with one another on a deep level, to get to know one another, and to learn and grow together. So we must become a church of small groups. And look what it says in in Hebrews. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect are meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. Now, of course, this verse applies to our Sunday morning meetings, that we can encourage one another and motivate one another to to love and good works, and we should not assemble together. We should come together on Sunday mornings. But how much can we do on a Sunday morning that can be done in a small group? That's the difference, right? So it's not either or. It's both, and we must have our Sunday morning meeting in addition to all of us being a part of some small group. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that what if you're not into what I'm into? Well, then you can start a small group about what you're into, what you're interested in. We should have so many small groups in our, in our church where there is something for everyone, wherever your interests are. It doesn't have to be a Bible study group necessarily. You can bring the Bible into it, but it can just be a common hobby that you have but you're able to connect with one another and talk to each other. Does that sound like a good, good idea? So we must become a church of small groups, and I think the idea of, of not being so static with our small groups, if we perhaps have them for a few months and then have a few weeks off and then have them for another few months and we give people the opportunity to change their group if they want, or there's lots of things that we can think about to make small groups appealing to all of us. So we're going to be doing that and looking into that over the next year or two. So we can see transformation for our church. And you know what? You know what this November is? I think most of us are aware that this November we are celebrating 50 years here in this building. That that not right? November is 50 years, 1968. So I want us by this November to be able to look back and say, we've come a long way since Daniel's been here right? We've come a long way since we decided we want to rebuild our church and see our church transformed. And you know what? We've already seen a lot of progress. So, so don't feel like it's all ahead of us. We've done a lot of good work already. But by November, I want us to say, boy, you know, even in this just past year, we've seen some good things happen. I'm not talking about all that needs to be done. I'm saying, have we made progress? Can we confidently say we're on the right track? By this November, when we're celebrating that 50th anniversary, I want us to say, yeah, God is doing good things among us. Does that sound like a good goal to have? So let's just close my message this morning with just four. I just chose a passage from the Apostle Peter in his letter, his first letter, and I feel like these are four good things that we can be thinking about and doing in our lives to see, to to allow us to become the kind of people that we need to be. You know, there's a lot of work that we need to do But it's not going to work if we don't know how to work with each other and how to treat one another. So the first thing that Peter said is to be earnest and disciplined in your prayers, right? And everything that we do, of course, as individuals, but as a church especially, we must do it with prayer. You know, my dad is always talking about how, you know, we really don't have enough prayer times uh, at our church where we get together and we pray for our church and we pray for the leadership. And we pray for what we're doing and how it will affect people. We need to do that more often. We need to be earnest and disciplined in our prayers to really know if we're following God and doing what he wants us to be doing. Secondly, Peter said we need to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. 
I, I'm sure this never happens, but do we ever have conflict with one another in our church? Never? Nah. Of course we do, right? We have conflict with one another sometimes in our church. <laughs> Something that stuck out to me, and you know what? Paul, Peter said here that love covers a multitude of sins. That if we love one another, I'm not saying we just ignore the conflict, but it's going to help, the love that we have for one another is going to help us get through those conflicts. And something stuck out to me yesterday. I don't know if you guys caught this. We went to, we had actually a very nice service for Beth Bailey yesterday in London. We, we tra- some of us traveled to, to, to that service. It was sad, sad that she's gone, but we, we, I even learned something about her yesterday that she would often say, her daughter said that Beth would often say to her children, to her daughters, that whenever they had a conflict, she would say, well, at least we still love each other, and that's what's most important, right? And, and, and the idea is, is that, okay, we have this conflict, but we love each other, so we're going to get through this. It's okay. And that's what happens in our marriage. That's what happens in a love-based relationship. But that can only work, as I said, if it is based on love. If you, for the most part, are showing virtue to one another and loving one another in that genuine, genuine way, then when the conflicts come, as they will inevitably come, you have a motivation to get through them, to work through them. So I, I love all of you, and I, and I hope you love me, and that we love each other as a congregation. And even though we might have our differences sometime, we can get through it because love covers a multitude of sins. Thirdly, Hospitality. We need to show hospitality to one another. Peter said, be hospitable to one another without complaint. <laughs> you know, Paul came here on Friday. I'm going to pick, a, uh, in a good way, pick on you, Paul. He came here on Friday. He unpacked the chairs. We have our new chairs in the back chapel area. He unpacked them. And they were hard to unpack, weren't they? He set up the coffee table. He didn't complain once, right? Maybe a little bit about the chairs. <laughs> But he diligently did it, right? And I see that with so many of you. You diligently come and you serve others and you are hospitable to others and you do it without complaint. And that's what we need to be doing as a church. And the thing is, if we can't do it to our church family, how are we going to do it to the people of the world, right? So we need to do it with one another so that we will do it for everyone. Lastly is along those same lines, service. Because he said, Peter said, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. God has gifted each of you with something to do. So he said, use them well to serve one another. All of us, each of us has something to offer in terms of the work of ministry that we need to do as a church. You know, I have my strength and you have yours. And we work together and we do the ministry of the church. So whatever it is you do, whatever it is you do that drives you, do it for others and do it as he said use them well to serve one another do it for the sake of others for the sake of their benefit of course you're going to get benefit too so it's not a purely selfless thing but you're doing it for others as well let's have paul and sarah come we're going to close our service this morning we're going to serve one another but we can and will See transformation in our church. We're, we're seeing transformation. I, I've been seeing it. And I've been encouraged. I think one of the reasons why I am not feeling burned out right now, despite the fact that I am being, I'm very busy right now. I have lots of Bible college school that work that I'm doing. I have lots of uh, church work that I'm doing and, and, and so on. But I'm not really feeling burned out. Please keep praying for me that that, that that doesn't happen. But I think one of the reasons why I'm not feeling burned out and in fact, I'm feeling energized It's because I'm seeing the progress we're making as a church. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Because if we do, if we do run this race with endurance and we do it for the long term, we're going to see new people come to the Lord. We're going to see ourselves have a renewed commitment to the Lord and have a refreshed relationship with God. We're going to see the truth about the gospel and about God proclaimed to the community. And we're going to see people embrace it. As I said about November and about the years to come, we're going to be able to look back and we're going to say, boy, God has done a lot through us. He really did transform our church and we're doing great things for him. But we're not there yet, but we're on our way. Greater things are yet to come. So let's sing this song together. He is the God of this city. He is the God of Fond Hill the God of Canada, the God of the world, and 
greater things have yet to come because he's going to do it for us. Let's stand together.